Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis de la finance inclusive, c'est avec un grand plaisir que la Banque de Luxembourg réitère son hospitalité envers les conférences de la, des midis de l'inclusion financière en vous accueillant dans notre auditorium. Nous sommes fiers d'être à nouveau vos partenaires. Depuis de nombreuses années, les organes dirigeants d'ADA réussissent avec succès à inviter des orateurs avec des horizons et des compétences variées, à alterner des sujets à capter l'attention d'auditeurs nombreux, et tout ceci en vue d'acquérir de nouvelles connaissances et ainsi de développer le secteur de l'inclusion financière à Luxembourg. Cette fois-ci, vous suscitez l'intérêt avec un sujet bien catchy, « Banana skills, the risk facing the microfinancing industry ». En tant que banquier de confiance de nombreux entrepreneurs, de philanthropes, d'organisations sans but lucratif, nous comprenons très bien que les risques perçus sont les pires ennemis de tout projet. Cerner les risques, les ordonner par priorité, les comprendre et bien sûr aussi les gérer et les adresser est primordial afin d'évoluer dans tout secteur sans y laisser des plumes. Ceci est en particulier vrai pour le secteur de la microfinance. Nos clients, qu'ils proviennent du secteur marchand, commercial ou qu'ils travaillent pour le bien public, s'intéressent à de tels investissements, que ce soit soit par conviction ou parce que tout simplement ils sont à la recherche d'alternatives dans un marché à taux d'intérêt créditeur proche de zéro. Donc nous sommes impatients et curieux de connaître ces risques et d'écouter l'exposé de messieurs Mendelssohn et Rosas et auteurs donc de ce, cette grande étude « Microfinance Banana Skills ». Donc merci beaucoup et nous nous réjouissons de se exposer. Thank you, Diane. So we'll uh, we'll switch to English as the um, presentation will be in English as well and question answers uh, later on too. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 29th edition of the Midi de l'Inclusion Financière. This time organized in partnership with Network Infine, whose chairman, Michel Makel, is, is with us today. Uh, and as always, uh, supported by Banque de Luxembourg and uh, the Luxembourg Development Corporation. As uh, Diane was saying, the topic today is Banana Skins 2014, the, face, uh, the risks facing the microfinance industry. Why did we choose it? Well, for one, a very interesting survey has been published a few months ago, a copy of which I think you all have in, in the handouts. It's um, the fifth of its kind, um, and we'll talk more about it with our guests in a minute. We, um, I think, all want to see a well-functioning, socially inclusive microfinance sector through which clients can be protected as much as, as is possible from the impacts of internal and external risks that are inherent in the uh, provision of inclusive financial services. To achieve this, though, we need to know what these risks are and how they can be mitigated. At ADA, our action invariably includes the promotion of transparency, the implementation of tools for the measurement of social responsibility and risks, and ultimately to contribute to the prevention of over-indebtedness. This is why last year ADA became a founding member of the RIM, RIM, initiative, a collaboration of organizations whose aim is to raise the bar in microfinance risk management by contributing to the development of awareness of best practices and appropriate standards globally. But even only looking at it from Luxembourg, as we are here today, this has to be a good thing, since more than 60% of European microfinance investment vehicles, funds, are domiciled here. So risk, reputation do matter. So what are the main worries 
that keeps the microfinance world awake at night? Is it competition over indebtedness? Is it funding liquidity? Or is it governance and regulations? Um, what are the main risks that the industry is facing today and potentially the risks that it might be facing tomorrow? The answers to this, or some answers hopefully, will be provided by our two speakers that we have here today, Sam Mendelssohn and uh, Daniel Rosas. Uh, very briefly, Sam Mendelssohn uh, works for Arc Finance as a knowledge specialist, and he has co-authored uh, the Banana Skin surveys since 2009. Uh, Daniel Rosas is an independent microfinance consultant with broad-ranging expertise, including risk and um, crisis management, and he worked with Sam Mendelssohn on the 2014 survey. So we're glad to have these two knowledge practitioners with us, and uh, we leave the floor for the presentation, uh, after which, as usual, uh, you will have the opportunity to ask uh, questions. Over to you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Ada, uh, for uh, welcoming and inviting us to come and speak to you. And thank you to the uh, bank for hosting today. Uh, Daniel and I are very pleased to be here. And uh, David Lassels, who is the third co-author of this report, uh, was unable to come. Uh, but I know he passes on the same sentiment. Thank you also for letting me speak in my native language and not forcing me to speak a, a butchered French. Trust me when I tell you it's better for all of us, but I will try to speak particularly um, clearly and slowly for those um, who don't speak native English. We're also mindful of limited time today, so Daniel and I are going to try to present as briefly as we reasonably can and leave as much time for what we hope will be a vibrant uh, Q&A afterwards. I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to the survey and the context in which every year or 18 months this survey comes about. And then I'm going to summarize the, the dull stuff, what actually is in the report. And then Daniel will talk about the more interesting stuff, which is what we think this means, the interpretation. Uh, so a little bit on the context and background. This may be a little bit of uh, self-promotion, but there are a few blue pages in the middle of this report which were never done uh, before. Now, this is an opinion piece that Daniel and I wrote looking back on the last uh, 10 years, really since 2005, the year of microcredit, <clears throat> on what we think have been the key trends over the last decade and what we see going forward. The reason I mention this uh, is because uh, it's... Sorry, I lost my, uh, lost my place there. Uh, the, these are the themes that come up regularly in the responses. So what have we seen? And all of us will be aware of these. We've seen a general shift from a poverty alleviating focus in microfinance to a financial inclusion agenda. A growing commercialization and a diversification of providers. <clears throat> We've seen crises, Bosnia, Morocco, Nicaragua, Andhra Pradesh, and maybe some more to come. Maybe this is something we can talk about after. We've seen a diversification of financial products in microfinance beyond the boilerplate microcredit loan the emergence of savings, of insurance, different delivery channels, including mobile. And I think everyone in this room and the respondents to the survey realized a few things. One is that micro-entrepreneurship and the belief that everyone on a street corner selling tomatoes is a burgeoning successful entrepreneur may have been oversold. It may be that consumption smoothing is, as we do when we use credit, is just as important. 
we better understand the nature of clients' needs that we did 10 years ago. The portfolios of the poor series, for those that are familiar, helped us understand the very complex way that uh, clients use financial disintermediation to manage their financial lives as we do. We've seen the emergence of the client protection principles, the universal standards for social performance, and cloud-based MIS systems now available off the shelf for tier three MFIs, which weren't available before. And so after these crises, where we're left now is when what might be thought of as a third phase of modern microfinance. Now, putting aside that maybe the early 1970s and the Grameen start isn't really the start of microfinance. People have been lending to poor people for as long as there's been money and poor people. But I think we all intuitively feel that in the last decade, we reached the end of microfinance one, microcredit driven. There was a second phase, which has seen some of the trends I've just outlined, including these diversification of providers, but also overheated markets and crises. And now we may be shifting into a third phase and facing reality, which was a much agonized over topic for this report because it is very difficult to extract a single theme when you have more than 300 responses, both assessing severity of risks and providing cumulatively tens of thousands of words of comments to extract a theme. But we feel that facing reality reflects that microfinance the industry has learned some key and important lessons and is now uh, looking forward with some clarity about what it's for. We put together a timeline as well, and it would take too long to go into uh, real details of it here, but maybe you can look in the report um, at your own leisure. It's on the third page of the blue pages. But this is what it looks like. It's almost readable on that screen. And the yellow signs reflect the five banana skins reports that have been done over the years, alongside some other key milestones in the categories I just talked about. I won't dwell more now, but I commend this timeline to you. Um, what I will say is that the topics and the themes, the way the risks have been evaluated and discussed by respondents really does reflect changes in the sector over the last decade. So as briefly as I can about the methodology, uh, the survey goes out with the assistance of the, uh, the CSFI, the Center for Financial Inclusion, City Microfinance, and the Mixed Market to a growing list of respondents. I'm sure some of you in this room have been asked and have responded to this. Uh, every year we get more countries represented, a better balance of different types of respondents, practitioners, investors, donors, academics, analysts, raters, and the like. And they are asked to uh, assess the severity of a discrete list of risks, which changes somewhat from year to year. And they're asked uh, an open question to describe what they see as the key risks facing the industry in the next two to three years. And this year, we also asked them a question, what keeps them up at night? What that means, what that was designed to do in effect was to mitigate the issue that while we ask people to talk about the industry, necessarily they always think about how they touch on the industry. Technology people will talk about technology. Practitioners will think about operational issues and the like. What this did was give us a very rich and deep wealth of, of comments of people talking both personally and trying to speak for the industry as a whole. This is a quick breakdown of response by geography. Uh, it's getting better is the short part. We've got more from Latin America, South Asia, and Africa, which we want more investors, uh, sorry, uh, more uh, practitioners, so we really get an idea of what's going on on the ground. Uh, there is in the report, for those who read it will know, is we have broken down the rankings by region, by type. Uh, I won't go into all that now. But I will get to what is the, the headline of the report. Now, with the caveat that this is a qualitative survey, 
And while over-indebtedness being clearly top will be the headline that a lot of people take away, there is a lot more to it than that. It's the, uh, it is what people say and not just the fact that it's uh, a serious amount at the, uh, at the top of the rankings. In previous brackets is the, uh, the previous survey's results. <clears throat> you will see a couple of things stand out. One is over-indebtedness is significantly higher. Uh, two, governance, risk management, credit risk, these operational issues are all high. And strategy, which was added this year, um, and which Dan will talk about more, uh, is a new entrant at six out of 19. This bears more dis, uh, attention than I have time for now, and Dan's going to go into certain parts of it more. But this is a correlation map, and I at least am particularly proud that we did it this time because uh, it wasn't done in any previous surveys. The key, and this is also reproduced in the port on page 12, I think, uh, the size of the circle represents the severity of the risk among respondents. The darkness and thickness of the line is the level of correlation. All of the lines on here are statistically significant. So these aren't all correlations between all risks, or it would look like a tube map. But uh, what are the obvious takeaways from this? Strong relationship between management and governance strong between risk management and governance. And in the top left, income volatility, financial capability, and over-indebtedness, this pocket of risks that talk about the relationship between the client and the institution. This is not a map of what risks actually are in microfinance. I must reiterate that the banana skin survey, since its earlier incarnations, because it started almost 15 years ago as a banking banana skins, and then insurance banana skins was added on a few years later, and then microfinance banana skins was added in 2007-8. This, we try to be honest brokers in reporting what the industry thinks. We try to, with the exception of the opinion piece in this uh, year's report, which is uh, exactly that, uh, we try, even when there are contradictions, or things that don't really make sense to us among all the responses, we try to just tell you this is what the microfinance industry is thinking about and cares about, is worried about, looking forward. So while this isn't a map of what the risks are in microfinance, I think the fact that you can see correlations in certain areas which intuitively make sense to us in the way we think about financial inclusion of microfinance uh, means that it's quite a good proxy for that. Finally, this is the Banana Skins Index. This traces the average severity score um, over the five reports. In the last one, we've changed from a 1 to 5 scale from a one to a 1 to 10 scale and have done the appropriate adjustments so that it can be uh, uh, looked alongside the others. What you will see is there is a significant uptick in average severity and top severity from 2009 to 2011, around the time of the Andhra Pradesh crisis. A slight downtick last time, and there's been an uptick again. I think there are two main themes that have come out of this report. The first is that over-indebtedness remains the most severe risk in the industry. It's not even across all markets or across all respondent types. But the num number of comments, both prompted and prompted about over-indebtedness, were considerable. But the second is that strategy came very high, and so many respondents reflected a belief that the industry, particularly practitioners, are not thinking long-term enough about their future. The strategic issues about on the side of investment in technology, in funding, and the staffing issues... Uh, that there's too much short-termism. And Daniel's going to talk about both of those themes a bit more now. Thanks. Thank you, Sam. Um, hello to all. Uh, good to see you again. Hello to uh, my colleagues at EMFP. Um, how many of you were at Microfinance uh, Week uh, this year? 
Uh oh. Okay. Well, you can close your eyes for a couple of slides because you might have seen them again. But uh, they're not all repeats, I promise. So, um, over indebtedness. Um, you know, this year we asked uh, what, what uh, Sam mentioned uh, this question about what keeps you awake at night. And um, you will see here and, and subsequent slides a few of these quotes. Um, and this one really stood out. Um, so, Frank Abate from the uh, Dominican Republic, um, basically seems to have ongoing nightmares about over-indebtedness. Um, and, and I think this is a, a, an interesting question because um, it, it stands out uh, it, not, not just the fact that it's number one, but it's also by, by the, the margin. Um, if you look at the r entire range of scores, average scores across uh, the board, so it's, the lowest score would be liquidity risk at 5.8, uh, and the second highest would be uh, credit risk at 6.9. So that's a range of 1.1. And then the distance between the number two and number one is half of the entire range of, the enti uh, of, the, uh, of all of the uh, risks uh, below. So um, it's, 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 it's really, um, w when you start scoring things on a scale of one to 10, you start realizing um, th things follow a certain pattern um, what, was, what was interesting is um, over indebtedness was the only one um, that not a single one of the 306 respondents selected as uh, the lowest risk of, of one. Um, and only two people uh, rated it as a two. Uh, no other risk came, uh, was, was anywhere close to that uh, level. Uh, and, and about two-thirds of the respondents rated it as, uh, as a seven or above, or actually eight, as, eight and above. Um, so I, th I think it's worth um, spending some time on, on thinking on why that might be the case. Um, just, and just before I do that, uh, take a look at the next three. Um, so credit risk, competition, and risk management. Um, so all of those are closely linked to over-indebtedness. Um, going back to the map that uh, Sam showed you, so here we have uh, over-indebtedness. Uh, number two risk, credit risk, is obviously closely related. Um, now, there is a difference. Um, I, I kind of view credit risk as the immediate risk of, of my portfolio that I have outstanding or my exposure to an MFI's portfolio um, um, going, you know, seeing, seeing the repayment problems in the, in the existing portfolio or, or in the loans that I'm making right now. Um, over-indebtedness is a more long-term risk. It's more a view of the market. It's more a view of a significant number of borrowers are becoming over-indebted or are at risk of becoming over-indebted. Um, and, and so there would be a difference between these two. And very few markets were uh, – actually, there, there's one example of a market where credit risk actually exceeded um, over-indebtedness, and that was Peru, because Peru at the time of the survey was already – dealing with some uh, significant delinquency issues. Um, not enough to necessarily call it a crisis, but, um, but that was one market that stood out. And, and there the scores were actually extremely high. They were, I believe, uh, uh, the average was nine um, for, for, for credit risk. Um, the third uh, highest is uh, competition. Um, and, and I think this is worth cons uh, thinking about from a perspective of why, d why does it show up so highly. Um, in microfinance, it's possible to get over-indebted by borrowing from one lender. Um, and it's possible to get over-indebted um, e even by taking one loan. But it's rare. Um, unlike in traditional finance, it's quite, quite common for people to take on, for example, a mortgage loan that's too big for them. We've seen it happen. Uh, in microfinance, that's not so common. What is common is to take out multiple loans from multiple lenders, and that is the primary path for over-indebtedness. So, Multiple borrowing is not necessarily the same thing as over-indebtedness, but they're very closely related. Um, and that happens through competition um, or, or through uh, um, unsustainable competition. Uh, not, uh, some competition is good, but not all competition is good. Um, and the thing that ties them together is risk management, um, and, that's, and that's the number, number four spot. Uh, so what, what you really see is, is this confluence of factors. In, 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 one, in one place, uh, all suggesting that the, the things that concern the sector um, on average are essentially uh, markets that are 
potentially uh, at unsustainable levels or at risk of becoming unsustainable. Because really, at the end of the day, overindebtedness risk is not the risk of any one client becoming overindebted, though that, of course, is a problem, but it's a risk of too many clients falling overindebted. There's always going to be, no matter how careful you are, there's always going to be one or two that might become over-indebted. It's just the nature of, of life. Um, there are risks. And, of course, one of the keys to client um, protection is how you manage that. But um, in terms of preventing over-indebtedness, the key is to prevent excessive over-indebtedness, to prevent over-indebtedness that starts affecting a significant number of borrowers and starts at that point posing the risk to both the borrowers and, and the sector. Um, I just have a few minutes. I'm going to run through this uh, fairly quickly. Uh, I think it's worth thinking about why do we face this, and it's not just microfinance. Um, there is something uh, that makes the credit market, as a market, uh, different from, from, from most, uh, most, pretty much any other market. Um, consider this. Um, for the, most of you, this might, for many of us, this is uh, maybe harkens back to early memories in college. Uh, uh, lecture rooms, kind of like this one. Um, maybe the younger of you just saw it yesterday. But anyway, um, so th think, think of how this works in practice. Uh, let's say um, you go, you want to buy a television. Um, there are essentially two drivers that are going to dictate how you go, go through that process. One is how, how important a television is to you um, relative to all of the other demands on, your, on, on the money that you have. You have to pay the rent, you have to buy some food and so forth. Um, and um, uh, on the second, uh, on, the, on, the, on the other side is uh, the, the producers and, and retailers' ability to sell televisions at a price that, that is profitable to them. And hence you develop this equilibrium fairly straightforward. Now let's, let's think of how this works in credit. Um, let's, let's imagine that an electronics store would operate the way a lender would. So I go to a store, I meet with a clerk. He shows me some television models. Uh, I, I say, yeah, this one is interesting. And then he turns to me and says, you know, Mr. Daniel, uh, I would love to sell you this television, but frankly, uh, you're not qualified to buy it. Right? That's, that's the model. Um, and and, and this, is a, this, this, this is a really key point to, to, to consider because the, the, the process by which the equilibrium would get established does not really exist in credit. The decision point of saying this TV is too expensive or this loan is too expensive is very weak because I'm not estimating do I have the money to buy this loan. The loan itself is money. What I'm estimating is will I make enough money over the next three years and what will be the relative uh, component of expenses that I can afford to spend on this loan over the next three years. We're pretty bad at making that decision. I don't care how, how much financial education you've had. That's not what people are good at. And so at the end of the day, the decision is mainly on the supplier. The supplier makes the product, the supplier sells the product, and the supplier decides who to sell that product to. And, and, and that's why this model really doesn't, doesn't work in, in credit. And not just microfinance, credit, credit generally. And this is why over indebtedness is, is, is the number one, and I think will stay number one, as, as it should be because it is really the number one long-term risk facing the sector. Um, so I'm, I'm going to jump through these slides fairly quickly. One, one thing to keep in mind is that microfinance is not that different from, from, from other sectors. Um, I, I, I have in these slides kind of show how quickly a, a credit bubble can form, how fast a, a over indebtedness can expand. This is India, and you know, in roughly three years um, it, it, it managed to get into crisis. Bosnia, the same thing. But this is maybe a, an interesting one. This is the subprime market in the U.S. Notice from 2004 to 2006, three years of very rapid growth, uh, far removed from historical patterns, and then the crash in 2007, and we know the results afterwards. So microfinance is really not that different. Once a se sector takes off, there is not that much uh, uh, to stop it, and it won't take that long to crash. So it's not going away, um, and, and we're going to keep dealing with it. Why are we still worried about it now? This is something that I showed in not so long ago, and this is a comparison of uh, 
of, over, uh, of multiple borrowing in three markets uh, taken at market peaks for each of those. So Morocco in 2008, Andhra Pradesh in 2010, and Bosnia in 2009. And the way to interpret it is um, you have Bosnia here. Uh, the way to see is 24% of the Bosnia market was supported by borrowers who had two loans. 21% was supported by borrowers who had five or more loans. Bosnia was a, already a major outlier um, relative even to Andhra Pradesh. But this is Mexico today. Um, there is some question whether the, this particular data set, which was collected by, by Finca, um, is, is fully representative of the sector there. Uh, and perhaps it's not. But one thing that is not under question is the fact that, over, uh, that multiple borrowing in Mexico is widespread, extremely widespread. Um, and, and, uh, and obviously, numbers like this have no, uh, uh, no historical precedent. Um, and, and I think not only Mexico but other countries uh, face issues like this. Um, so let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, Sam mentioned strategic risks. Um, w one thing that, that stood out is um, if, you, if, you, if you think of of, the, uh, of an institution's positioning to, you know, looking out into the future, am I going to position to, uh, to the changing market dynamics correctly, you might look at some of the components of that strategy. Um, and and one, of the, one of the significant changes that's happening is, is technological change and, and mobile money. Uh, interestingly enough, it's fairly low on the list. Um, another one would be, am I meeting the client's needs um, in a way that will... Uh, prevent uh, competitors from taking away market share. Um, also relatively low, certainly in the second half, so the bottom half of the risks. And yet both are components of strategy. So there seems to be a bit of a divergence. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't maybe go too deep into that. There are also technical reasons why that might be the case. Um, but there's no question that the, that the sector is changing. That, as, as, as Sam mentioned, uh, you know, if you look at the timeline uh, of the evolution of, of microfinance, and now you know the broader uh, idea of financial inclusion, um, we have been in the past couple of years already in in the new phase. It's the post-crisis phase. It's sort of looking ahead, and that 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 path is uncertain. Um, a lot is happening uh, on the mobile sector. A lot is happening on, on, on the regulatory front. You've had, uh, in the past three years, I would say, uh, maybe a couple of dozen credit bureaus really coming online. That never existed before. It raises real questions as, does that protect the sector, or does that actually introduce additional things that we need to now think about? Um, because certainly the United States market has a fantastic credit bureau, uh, three of them. Um, and as is true in, in, in Europe. So in and it's, it, itself, it doesn't prevent over indebtedness, but it's a key, a key tool. There's also uh, the issue of, of client needs. Client needs are not necessarily changing. I think client needs have always been there to some extent. There is the concept of clients who have uh, been introduced to formal financial services through credit are now maybe a bit more open to uh, other things. Um, uh, but... The, other, the flip side of it is institutions that have founded themselves uh, 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 on a mission, on the original mission to provide credit to microenterprises, uh, how much can they really change to adapt to the, to the new needs of clients and to adapt to the new market realities? Um, if, even if you look at, 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 at really highly diverse institutions in, in South America and Peru, to this day, the majority of their revenues come from the microcredit portfolio. That is the most profitable portfolio, and that is the largest portfolio. That has not changed. There are some exceptions, but they are truly exceptions. Um, so so a, 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 as, the, as the sector evolves and changes, um, you know, we, we face the question, you know, where do we go next? And I think uh, it would be a great thing to talk about. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Chairman of uh, Infine, I'm very pleased and honored to have, been, uh, to have joined uh, his organization of these events. 
And I would take this opportunity to uh, give you some thoughts about what I learned today and what I heard today, uh, not something fundamentally new, but shown in, an, uh, in a particular way. And the main message I take out of it is, of course, that over-indebtedness is not an extraordinary phenomenon or an extraordinary risk to be put forward, but it's a normal risk of the activity. Uh, but we should deal with it in a responsible manner. Uh, well, I take as a conclusion also that there are, and we have seen on the long list, the different risk factors, but there is no single one we can take out, turn it around, and then everything is being solved. But we have to work on all the different uh, aspects and uh, help uh, to, to help the, the whole uh, activity and to make it evolve in the way it should. Um, I took furthermore the time to have a more in-depth look, and I invite you to do so, in the study. And I came upon an, a quote by Steve Hollingworth, who said, who complained, I will not give the whole quote, but I will summarize it, who complained very much that the brand of microfinance was damaged. And he said it's damaged mainly because the uh, objective of profitability is too much put into focus and not enough the other focus, which is to help poor people out of poverty. And here is exactly one of the targets, uh, one of the focus of, of, of microfinance, and, and it's, uh, the main challenge is confronted with is to find this fine balance between the two targets. It has to be profitable. It cannot be not profitable, but it has as well a very social objective uh, to fulfill. Uh, pursuing balances is not very attractive as such. I mean, pursuing highest profitability is uh, very attractive. Pursuing a pure social objective, of course. I mean, you feel like a saint if you are doing so. But somewhere the balance, and the balance may be moving from region to region. This requires a lot of energy. It requires a lot of attention, of monitoring of what's going on. And I can only congratulate you with this study that it helps forward to make progress in inclusive finance, quite generally speaking, and microfinance in particular. I also noticed that in the questions which were raised that uh, some aspects were mentioned. I mean, you were talking about regulation, of course. Regulation is always to find, to find a good balance. Again, not very attractive, but find the right balance. And another topic, sometimes I wonder whether it's mentioned enough, is mobile technology. An extremely important issue. We have seen the case of Kenya, which made an excellent progress. Thanks a lot to technology. But um, I am sure that technology can do more still. Quite generally speaking, the field uh, of uh, inclusive finance and microfinance in particular. This, ladies and gentlemen, brings me to the end, and I want to thank uh, Sam and Daniel, in particular, for this extraordinary study. Of course, also the CSFI and City. I mean, without them, you wouldn't be here with uh, presenting the study. I would thank Jill for moderating. I would also thank the audience, and in the audience, I noticed, not because I saw you, but because I saw the list, a lot of representatives from the Luxembourg School of Finance, and I hope that what they heard here and what they have the chance uh, to look more in-depth thanks to the studies that we've given to them, they will take this and reflect on it in further work they will be doing in the future, in the near and the longer future, not only the short time future, but the long term future as well. I want also to thank the colleagues from Infine and uh, ADA who have done a remarkable job, in, as usual, in organizing these events. And this is really a big job. And finally, Banque de Luxembourg, of course, for hosting us. And to conclude, invite you to join us all with uh, light dinners that will be well, light uh, cocktails that will be served, as well as some drinks. Thank you again and hope to see you for the next events. Maybe.